Hi, this is Professor Ellis with week six of Specialized Communications for Technology Students. This is English 1133, fall 2021. I hope everybody's doing well, uh, that you're healthy, that you're, you're able to get all your work done in your other classes, uh, get all your professional work done in your jobs, taking care of your families, and of course, taking care of yourselves. Because uh, it's absolutely important in order to get through this that we're also looking after ourselves. Um, in addition to you know, getting vaxxed up, uh, wearing masks, using social distancing when we can, uh, make sure you're taking care of yourself. You're eating well, trying to get sleep. Um, I mean, these are the things that can keep us going. Make it uh, you know, one day at a time uh, so that we can see this whole semester through and see it through successfully. So um, we have a lot of things to go over today, but I again want to try to keep our lecture as compact as possible. Um, so that you have more time of our class time. You know, again, that's the three hours base uh, each week of work. And then, of course, some of that's going to bleed over into that additional twice as much time um, as class time you should be doing on homework, weekly writing assignments, etc. cetera. Uh, before we get into this week's class, just want to remind you, make sure you contact me if you're having some trouble. Some folks have, and I appreciate that, because, I mean, that's what I'm here for. I want to make sure that I can help each and every one of you be successful in the class. And that's going to vary from student to student. So whatever it is you need or you need to talk about or you need to ask questions about, here's my contact information. Remember, you can email me, jellis at citytech.cuny.edu. And I got my office hours on Wednesdays from 3 to 5 p.m. There's that link to Google Hangouts uh, on the left-hand side of our Open Lab site and at the top of our syllabus. So both those places, you can find the link. You just click on it, you log in with whatever Gmail or Google account you have, and then you'll find me there between 3 and 5 p.m. on Wednesdays. Now, in addition to that time, I can also meet with you at other times. All you got to do is send me an email letting me know your availability. That means when you're free over like the next week. And then I'll try to find a time in my schedule between meetings and teaching and everything else that we can both meet up and I'll let you know this is the time that seems to work best for the both of us. So remember to let me know how I can help you. And that's why uh, you us using email, using office hours is vitally important for our class, being in an asynchronous class, because all of our interaction is really me giving you these lectures, uh, our occasional email work, the work you turn in on Open Lab, and of course the feedback I'm about to soon be giving you um, on the job application portfolios. So looking at this week, uh, let's start off with a little bit of review of where we were last week. Uh, so we were talking about project one, the job application portfolio. Um, we finished up all the major components of the project, that is the skills resume, the experience resume, the job application letter, and the LinkedIn.com profile. And I showed you how, in a previous lecture, how to export all those files into the formats I want to see them in for me to evaluate and then give you a grade. Um, meaning that for the skills resume, the experience resume, and the job letter, they should each be a PDF file. And then for your LinkedIn.com uh, profile, I wanted you to use Firefox uh, because it has that cool built-in a uh, full screenshot feature so that you could basically save your LinkedIn.com profile as a PNG file, it's a graphic format file uh, that I would be able to easily open and look at on my computer and I could just scroll through and be able to see everything um, as you see it on LinkedIn. So th those are the four deliverables you know, for the project and we're going to talk this week how you're going to get those to me but uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Now, in addition to wrapping up the job application portfolio, before you finalize those documents to turn in this week, uh, we were doing peer review on your deliverables. Um, and you're going to send those four files to the other members of the class uh, so that you can ask the others in class for feedback and that you could give feedback on their deliverables in return. Right now, uh, I, you know, I'm recording this lecture on Monday, um, but so far I haven't seen anybody in the class uh, participate in peer review. Uh, 
uh, you know, we got seven members in the class. I know it's a small class size, um, but I do want to make sure you understand that this is an important part of the writing process. Uh, and I'm sure you've already encountered it before. I know in English 1101, English 1121, the writing process is taught where you draft, you elicit feedback through peer review. Based on that feedback, you revise your work again for eventual submission. Um, this is something that's you know, not just something that we teach in our classes to help you make your writing better, but it's also something you'll be doing in the workplace one day, which is why it's important. You get a lot of practice doing that um, so that in the workplace, there's not going to be like a case where, like, say, a manager or supervisor is going to say, okay, everybody, let's do peer review on this document uh, real quickly. I'm going to distribute papers. I want you to write your comments. It, it more than likely isn't going to work that way. Usually, peer review is something that you either have to initiate on your own in the understanding that it's going to help create stronger deliverables for the company you work for, uh, but there could also be some kind of oversight that's built into that, depending on the workplace, uh, where it's, you know, in a sense, monitored, uh, and it could be things that show up later whenever you have your performance reviews. So this is something that you want to incorporate into your daily practices uh, as a writer. And you know, it doesn't matter what kind of profession you're going into, uh, writing is going to be a big part of it in a lot of different ways. Um, you're going to be called on to do writing, whether it be simply just for communication on a daily basis or for actually producing deliverables. And peer review is a way to get some feedback to make those communications as strong as possible, as persuasive as possible. So in the case of your job application portfolio, we want to get that peer review feedback to make your documents as bulletproof as possible. So they can't be eliminated because of typos, grammatical problems of missing parts we want to make them look good and the idea is that even though you're still like you know, in your track through your degree and maybe not quite ready to get into your career workplace your first career workplace but this class is intended to help you understand how to build these types of job seeking documents so that when you are ready it's not going to be like you're reinventing the wheel for you. You're going to already know what to do. You'll already have a set of documents that you can then revise and work on and make even better because you've learned more, you've gained more experience, and you can incorporate those things into the documents you send out for um, the jobs you want to apply for. So, uh, and I also understand that you know, there's folks that are, that are still running a little bit behind. And I don't want you to think like, if you don't get peer review done by this Wednesday, you can't do it at all. I don't want you to think that. If folks are running behind, as soon as you are ready, find that email that I sent to all the members of the class last week. Um, if you don't see it in your inbox, check your junk folder just in case, because sometimes it does get flagged that way, uh, because it's sent to you know, a number of people. Wherever it is, whether it be inbox or your junk mail, you want to click reply all so that everybody sees your response. You attach your documents, you make your ask and offer, uh, you're asking for feedback, you're offering your feedback in return to others, uh, and then you wait to start seeing responses from other folks so that you, know, you get feedback you need and you can be giving feedback uh, on their documents. All, all this is stuff we covered in our last uh, lecture. So even if you can't get that done by Wednesday, if you, you know, whenever you're ready, send that reply all email out. Um, and for everybody in the class, keep an eye out for those emails. Uh, you know, if someone sends that out late, but they have given you some feedback on your documents, well, you need to wait and watch for them to send you their documents, which you still need to give feedback for, even though it might be coming a little bit late. That's you know, not going to reflect poorly on you at all. Um, the idea here is to make sure that we are moving forward. Everybody is following the writing process, that they're getting the deliverables as strong as they can, and then we're going to be 
eventually submitting those documents, those deliverables to me so that I can give you a grade on them, some feedback on them from my perspective, um, which you can incorporate and improve on uh, those documents in the future. So again, even if you're not you know, ready to do peer review by Wednesday, if like you're ready Thursday, Friday, Saturday, send those emails out, okay? I mean, it's better late than never, um, at least as far as our class is concerned. But in the workplace, obviously, deadlines are deadlines. And I don't want to give anybody the false impression that you can drag things out in the workplace because obviously in the workplace you do this and you do it consistently, you're more than likely going to get fired. Um, so as I said at the very beginning of the semester, our class is a safe place. I want us to model the best of workplace practices, but I also understand there are you know, extenuating circumstances with the fact we're still in a pandemic. I know people are looking for work or have lost jobs. I know people are taking lots of classes, many of them online. And of course, the, all of these things layered on top of one another, you know, kind of throws a monkey wrench in the things that we want to achieve. Um, so what we're going to do is try our best uh, to work within these constraints to achieve the learning outcomes that you need. Um, with the understanding that there are special circumstances that we're having to fight against. So don't give up on any of the projects. If you got to turn it in late, um, turn it in late. Um, though, uh, as I've said before, email me. Let me know what's going on um, so that I can be watching you for when you do turn things in late. And again, follow that up with an email saying, Professor Ellis, I finally turned that thing in. Um, will you check it off for me? So that, that lets me know to go back and check things for you. So that's that. Okay, and so for the weekly writing assignment, uh, I had you do a memo uh, on technical background reports. I had signed you some reading from David McMurray's technical writing textbook online um, so that you could learn a little bit about what a what he terms a technical background report is because that's very germane, meaning very on topic for the type of report you're going to be writing in our class, um, where you're going to be writing about something that other people have done that I'm not expecting you have to have done the actual primary research. You're going to be doing what's called secondary research, and I'll explain all that more during today's lecture. So for this week, we need to talk about how to submit your Project 1 documents after you've done peer review and you've had a chance to revise them. Um, your project isn't, you know, the, the deadline is next Wednesday, uh, which is going to be October 20th. Um, but again, if you're having to, you know, if we have to drag this out a little bit extra because of peer review, then you wait for some peer review, revise your documents, and even if you have to turn it in after the 20th, that's okay, but you gotta email me to let me know that you're planning to submit late, and then follow that up with an email that you did submit something late. But if you can get peer review feedback and get this thing in on the 20th, that's like the ideal situation. Now, one other thing I'll, I'll mention, um, for those folks that are rip roaring to go after you've sent out your documents for peer review with you know, clicking reply all to that email that I sent to the class. Um, you can also get peer review feedback from other folks. Okay, uh, you can ask your know, relatives, you can ask friends, family. Um, the idea is to like get as many eyes on your documents as possible because each person that looks at them will come at it from their own knowledge, their own perspective and it'll give you ideas and it's then your job to decide well do I want to make this change that this person has suggested or make this other change a different person suggested because they won't always jive and so that's where it comes down to like your decision making pro process to evaluate these options and then decide what course of action to make for yourself uh, it, there's not a requirement to follow everybody's advice you do still have to use your own good sense um, but those folks that have real world experience especially people that may work in the field that you're going into 
those will be the folks you probably want to listen to most strongly. Um, but that doesn't mean that others won't have good advice to give you. Um, so how are you going to submit project one? Well, what I want to do is underneath this week's lecture, I'm going to include a link to this Dropbox file request page. And you can see on this page, and the thing is you don't even have to sign in to Dropbox to use this, okay? Um, though you should know, or if you haven't heard, CUNY provides all students and faculty with a free Dropbox account. Um, and I'll show you how to get that in just a second. Uh, but as far as turning in your project, you don't actually have to use that. Uh, I will provide you with this link, which anybody can access even if they're not signed into Dropbox. Now, when you, see, when you get here, you can see it's got my name on it. It has my picture over here in, on the right. And you can see the title, Job Application Portfolio, English 1133, Fall 2021. And I gave you some, I, I'll give you some directions here. Please name your job application portfolio files according to the examples below and upload them here. So there's four files I need. One, last name, that would be your last name, dash resume dash skills dot PDF. And so I give an example. And I'm going to tell you more about what EG means a little bit later in today's lecture. EG Smith dash resume dash skills dot pdf second file last name smith dash resume dash experience dot pdf three last name smith dash job dash application dash letter dot pdf and then the fourth this will be your linkedin.com profile uh, screenshot and again make sure you're doing a full page screenshot. I want to see your entire uh, LinkedIn.com profile. Uh, that would be last name dash LinkedIn dash profile dot PNG. And then I make a note here. These are due by end of day, uh, meaning by midnight on Wednesday, October 20th. If you need more time, touch base with Professor Ellis via email, as we just discussed. So the way this works is you can either like you can have a folder to the side so like here I had this folder open and I got my four files or George P. Burdell's files all listed here got burdell-linkedin.profile.png Burdell-resume-skills.pdf, Burdell-job application-letters.pdf, Burdell-resume-experience.pdf. So one way to do this is simply select the four files that you want to upload and then just drag them over so that they're going to be on top of this square space on the um, Dropbox page. And you can see it lists all four that I just dragged there. And then it's going to ask for your name and your email address. So I'll just put like George Burdell. And uh, because I don't have an extra City Tech email, actually, I can just use mine, it doesn't matter. That's right. JLS at citytech.cuny.edu. But that email address you type in there, and your name should be yours. So type in your name and your email address. After you've done that, just click Upload. A little square progress box there. You can see spinny, spinny, spinny. It's uploading the files. I'll be it very slowly. And what you want to do is leave this page open so you can watch the progress because once it's completed, you'll get a confirmation so that you know your files were uploaded successfully. Because uh, you don't want to you know, try to upload your files and not get that confirmation. So we got a green check mark on Burdell dash LinkedIn dot profile, a green check on the skills resume, green check on the application letter, green check on 
uh, the experience resume. And then you can see this little icon of the guy crossing the finish line, finished uploading, we'll let Jason Ellis know you uploaded files. And then they'll notify me that you uploaded your files successfully to Dropbox where I can download them, read them, and then once I uh, grade them, once I have a chance to grade them, you can go to our Open Lab page and over here on the left, here's the menu, my contact information, and then I have this link here for Course Gradebook. And you'll be able to click Check Your Grade, and there'll be one entry there for Project 1. And I'll give you a grade, and I'll write written feedback about my observations of the documents. Um, now, depending on like you know, each individual case, I might be able to just type all the notes, uh, but in certain circumstances, I might say, hey, let's talk this over uh, in office hours, um, which is another way that like, you know, we can you know, have more bandwidth to really look at your files and talk about them. But that will be on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but check your grade is where I'll be posting grades once I have a chance to grade everybody's um, job application portfolio deliverables, those four files. So for lecture week six, just look underneath and there'll be a link down here under this week's lecture um, going over to the Dropbox. See if I refresh that. Yeah, it'll look just like this. And then you can drag your files there or you can also click add files, files from computer. And we can go to downloads, and then you see all the files here. And you can all you get all you have to do is hold down Shift, select the first, select the last one. And you see all four highlighted, and then click Open, and then you can upload them that way as well. So two different ways to upload the files using Dropbox. All right, so that's submitting project one. So watch for that link underneath this week's lecture on Open Lab. So next what we need to focus on is Project 2. So first off, before I get into the details of Project 2, looking back on our Open Lab site, so we've got the understanding sign there, if I click on Syllabus, scroll down the table of contents and you'll see project 2 listed under grade distribution research based technical report 30 percent of your grade uh, this is the biggest single part of your grade in our class uh, so this is something we spend you know, a, a good amount of time on so it's something that you'll be able to develop over time it's not something i want to say okay yeah, go write it we're going to kind of break it up into components and help you do the thinking necessary that will help you develop a strong research report um, that not just gives you a good grade in the class, but as, as I've said before, everything that you make in my class, I want to be useful to you in some way outside of our class. And so this technical report that you write is going to serve a lot of different purposes. One, it's going to give you an opportunity to learn more about a topic that's relevant to your studies at City Tech, uh, whether that be you are a professional technical writing major in the class, which the majority of you are, or if you're um, in, the, in some of the other technical fields like computer info systems or electrical engineering technology. So there's a lot of opportunities here for you to learn more on your own, do self-motivated, your own investment in that kind of learning so that you essentially are gaining more knowledge than you simply would if you were just in a writing class. More knowledge than what you're getting in your major classes because you obviously, everybody that goes through your major classes are getting the same kind of knowledge, the same instruction on given topics. Here's a chance for you to really dive into something that you want to learn more about so that, let's say you go for a job interview 
that knowledge may be something that you can bring to bear on a question or in a response to a question uh, during that interview to show off that you know more than someone else applying for that same job. The other big thing that you're going to be getting out of this kind of project is a really great writing sample. This is something that you could submit to like City Tech Writer so that you can get a publishing credit to add to your resume. Or you could use this as a writing sample to put on your LinkedIn.com profile, to put into an ePortfolio, or to include as a part of a job application packet that you give to an employer that may request something like that. So there's a lot of different ways that this kind of work is beneficial to you outside of our class. And you should be keeping that in mind as you're working on it so that you're not just dialing this in. You want to be investing your, your time and energy to really pull off a really great project because you know, the, the, the utility of this is so much greater than simply just performing uh, for a class and performing for a grade. That you can carry this out of our class and get some real tangible benefit from it. Now, another thing I want to mention, uh, just briefly, so I'm not going to go into depth on the Project 3 until later this semester, but Project 3 is a research presentation which is worth 20% of your grade. The research presentation is going to be based on your Project 2 writing. So if you pull off a strong Project 2, then completing Project 3 is not that bad. Because you have done all the heavy lifting here, then it's just a matter of consolidating that writing into a shorter spoken script, creating um, you know, a presentation to anchor the things that you're saying, and then recording your work uh, so that it can be published online, like the kinds of lectures that I provide to you all. You're going to be making something like that uh, at the end of the semester. We'll, and we're going to talk more about that later on, but I just want you to see the road ahead of you so that you know where we're going. Um, that with Project 2, this is the heavy lift, and then toward the end of the semester is Project 3, which is going to have its own challenges, but you know, having a good Project 2 makes Project 3 really a breeze. It really honestly does. Uh, so that's what's coming ahead. So let's talk more about what Project 2 involves. You've already learned a little bit about what technical reports are, uh, but let me add some things to that. So what is a technical report? A technical report focuses on scientific or technological or technical topics. Um, a technical report uh, is, is going to you really get into the details of how something works, how something is put together, how we know something, um, how our knowledge has been gained over time. And so I give these, these extra ways of thinking about it here, processes, developments, and results. So a scientific um, or a technical report might involve a process. You might encounter you or you might write a technical report on the process of how we generate electricity from nuclear fission. Or you might describe the process of how electricity is distributed um, to large areas like a city. Uh, or a process of how um, the latest iPhone or the latest Google Pixel is assembled. Uh, a process for how an integrated circuit or a um, microchip is built. Uh, these are all processes, meaning there are step-by-step -step procedures that, in, that all involve very technical topics uh, in order for that final uh, thing uh, that artifact to be created or that service to be provided. Um, you could talk about developments, like how something came to be known. Um, so like you could have a technical report on evolution. You know, what you know, has built up the evidence for how evolution works, for example. Or uh, maybe the development of how vaccines came about. 
you know, if we want to think about that history of vaccine development, um, a technical report on how um, the personal computer market came to be what it is. You're thinking about like the original big three, uh, where we have like you know the Radio Shack TRS-80, um, the Apple II, uh, and the Commodore 64. Um, actually, not the Commodore 64, but the Commodore PET, uh, where these things ushered in uh, you know the era of the personal computer, and then there was obviously a lot you know more players that came in. Uh, in that history later on, like with IBM and their personal computer, um, Apple's introduction of the Macintosh, and then you get the big software players to come in, like Microsoft with um, Microsoft Windows and eventually Windows 95, etc. So that history is a development of like how the personal computer market came to be. Um, results. And here's where uh, usually we talk about technical reports as a way of presenting the results or findings of some kind of primary research. Primary research is when you do experiments, where you try to build things, where you test things, and you keep a record of all those results and then you tabulate them. You run them through different analyses in order to find out if you actually found something, if something was discovered. And then you write all that up, like how you were doing the research, how you reported uh, the findings, and what were your results, what you know, came out of that research that you did on your own or as a part of your company. Um, for our purposes, we're not gonna be doing that kind of uh, technical report in our class because I don't want you to think that you're gonna have to go out there and do experiments uh, and find out like some new knowledge uh, for this particular project. Also, I don't want, um, I want this work that you do on this project to be unique and new. It shouldn't be something that you're borrowing from something you've already done in another class. Because I can imagine like you've taken science classes, for example, where you will have been you know, doing experiments um, but I don't want like that kind of work to be recycled into this particular project. I want this to be new research that you're doing, but it's of a secondary nature. And you can see here the second port uh, supported by primary, which is the these results kind of um, reports. And then the secondary research is what we're going to focus on. Secondary research is when you're looking at the research that others have done before you. And in any kind of technical report or any kind of experiment that you might be conducting in the workplace, you have to do secondary research before you begin your own primary research. Because you don't just walk into the lab and say, I'm going to test this thing out. Well, it would probably pay to find out if anyone has ever done that similar kind of research before to save yourself a lot of time and trouble if, for example, that doesn't pan out or might be dangerous or if it won't produce the kind of results that you want. So the idea for secondary research is it's absolutely imperative to do it before you ever try to do any kind of primary research. But for the purposes of our project, we're only going to be doing secondary research, meaning we're going to be looking at the research others have done. Now, in general, technical reports present information in a clear, professional, and straightforward manner. Um, in these types of reports, uh, there is going to be an absence of I, of the self. Uh, they're presented in more of an objective fashion, uh, in a sense from a third person perspective, an objective style perspective. Um, so in these types of reports you won't report things like I think this or I believe that. Everything is going to be based on facts, it's going to be based on things that you can quote and cite and that you discuss using your own words. And Finally, re, uh, technical reports use established conventions, meaning like there are standards for how they're put together, like what parts 
and sections do you use in them? How they're laid out, meaning like how do they look? Uh, how is text arranged on the page? And then they involve professional styles. For example, APA or American Psychological Association, which is the, the style, the professional style uh, that we will be using for how we document your research uh, on the project, as I had noted on the syllabus originally in the class. Now, before we go further, I want to just give you a little background on some of these terms that I use in general that don't just apply to technical reports, but they are important for you to know, uh, and they may win you some money on Jeopardy or at uh, you know, uh, weeknight trivia at a bar. And it's these, um, these acronyms and abbreviations that I use a lot in my writing uh, for you all on Open Lab or in my slides uh, for the lectures. And that's EG, ETC, and IE. So E period, G period uh, is an abbreviation, uh, not abbreviation, but an acronym of Latin, exempli gratia, exempli gratia. And what that means is for the sake of an example, or just put simply, for example. Um, so, gratian is for the sake of, and exempli is example. You can see the root there, exempli, example, right? Um, but we, in English, can just think of it as meaning for example, the shortened version. So, how would you use it? Uh, I could write, I like many types of games, and then in parentheses, I write E period, G period, comma, space, first person shooters, comma, role playing games, comma, and strategy. So I'm giving these three types of games as examples of the types of games that I like to play, right? This, this next uh, term that you can use is ETC, period, okay? That's an abbreviation of etc. Uh, but you can actually write out etc. without the space. It's been incorporated into the English language. Um, but etc. it comes from Latin, and it means and the other things. Et means and, and cetera is the other things. Um, and the way we understand it is, and the other things of a similar sequence, meaning they're all alike in some way. So I can write, you know, as a use of this, my game collection includes flight simulators, comma, role-playing games, comma, etc., ETC period. And what that means is, includes flight simulators, comma, role-playing games, comma, and the other things the other types of games. And then finally, I period, E period, IE. And what this uh, acronym stands for in Latin are the words id est, id est. And what that means is that is, that is. And you use that phrase, that is, to rephrase or clarify a point. So it's like you say something one way, but you think to yourself, you know, maybe it would help my reader understand it better if I include another way to express the same idea, but like using different words. So here, she prefers to use Twitter. And then in parentheses, I write I period, E period, comma, that is the social media for angry people. So if someone doesn't know what Twitter is, then giving them this that is the social media for angry people gives them another way to think about what Twitter is. So E period, G period, EG, ETC period, and I period, E period. So they have very specific uses and purposes, and you can incorporate them into your writing not just for like a technical report, you can use them in emails, um, in text messages, you can use them anywhere. Um, but it's important, I think, to know where they come from, these Latin roots. Um, 
not just because you are all educated individuals, you know, getting college degrees, um, but I mean, it, it's also just an awareness of how, you know, where our language comes from. Uh, that language changes over time, uh, but there are lots of part, a lot of parts of our language uh, that you know come from very distant places and have a very long history behind them. All right, so now let's let's kind of drill down into what your research-based technical report for Project Two uh, involves. Okay. And I, for, I you know, forgot to think about it earlier, but uh, try to help remind me if you can. Um, make sure you're making notes on these lectures. You need to have a notebook out. You need to be writing this stuff down because just hearing me say it and just seeing it on the screen uh, is not going to be beneficial to you for actually remembering it in the long term. You've got to write this stuff down. The act of writing itself helps you remember this stuff better. Uh, and it's important for you to, to know not just stuff like, you know, e.g., ETC and IE, uh, but also to know the particulars of the project we might be working on. Uh, because you, by knowing what you're doing, obviously that'll make it easier to do. You won't be second guessing yourself, and you also won't be making up or inventing your own instructions, um, which I've seen a number of students in, both, in all three of my classes a semester doing in different ways, which is you kind of alarming because you know, you have to imagine when you're in the workplace those are the types of things that get you fired so you need to make sure you're always paying attention and following uh, what the directions what the guidelines are on uh, whatever task or project you might be involved in um, because that accuracy uh, is just that's the baseline you know we're not talking about like you being seen as like you know a stellar uh, employee in a company that's just you you're basically got you know a pulse um, and you have to go way beyond that then uh, to ever be considered like you know for promotions and bonuses and all this kind of stuff um, so make sure you are following along that you're making good notes uh, so that you know what is going on what needs to get done uh, on everything in the class so project two uh, you need to write a 1,500 to 2,000 word research-based technical report um, that's relevant to your studies. Uh, so if I pull out my calculator here, uh, 1,500 divided by 250, that's roughly a 6 to 8 page, with each page being double-spaced, uh, worth of writing. Okay, so I mean it's not a tremendously long technical report, uh, but it's also one that um, is going to involve a lot of research on your part to find quotes that you can incorporate into your writing to support the things that you're talking about. Because your research report, well, you know, in the title of what it is, means that this isn't just coming from your brain. That you're pulling from the knowledge that other people have done in their research and then presenting it in an aggregated, meaning that you're pulling together the research into your one report so that someone can read your report basically and get up to speed about whatever technical topic you've picked for your uh, technical report project. And so you can see here, you know, I write specifically, it's a research-based technical report relevant to your studies. That's important to always keep in mind. Now, for a couple of folks in class that aren't PTW majors, you're going to want to choose a topic that is relevant to what you're working in, whether it be electrical engineering or computer info systems and whatever maybe your specialization might be. Um, for those folks that are in professional and technical studies in the class, you'll want to focus on your specialization. So like here, I'm just looking at the college catalog uh, page for the professional technical writing bachelor of science degree. And as you all hopefully know, but if not uh, know yet, you have to choose a specialization for your PTW major. This is like the technical field where you're going to be learning about topics in that field specifically uh, in the hopes of getting a 
technical writing job within the a, you know a company that works in that given field. So your PTW degree means like you are a great communicator, a technical writer, but you need a specialization to hone in on the types of technical writing you'll be you know, most recognized for that you're going to be pursuing a career in. So for PTW major students, these are the specializations that you can work in. Uh, computer science, communication design, biology, chemistry, physics, public health, economics, psychology, social science, and marketing. Now, for those of you that have already declared your specialization, you'll want to find a topic within that specialization for your research-based technical report. For those of you that haven't decided yet on your specialization, what you can do is choose a topic in one of these specializations. It doesn't mean you're committing to actually enrolling in that specialization yet, but this can be your opportunity to learn more about it so you can then decide whether you want to choose that specialization for your degree or maybe look elsewhere. Because one of the things that I've found from my own experience is research is great you know, when you're researching things about like what you want to do in life. It's really important to cast your net as widely as possible so that you can find out the things that you don't want to do just as much as trying to find the things you want to do. Because it's actually quite useful to be able to eliminate some things from the pool of potential options for like say a career um, that you pursue. So again, uh, choose something that's related to your major or to your specialization in your major. Uh, for PTW, those specializations again are computer science, communication design, biology, chemistry, physics, public health, economics, psychology, social science, or marketing. Now, your report wouldn't be, you know, for example, about psychology. It would be about a topic within psychology. So, for example, you could, like if your specialization were psychology, you could do a technical report on a, a specific type of treatment regime uh, within psychology. Uh, or maybe about a um, maybe a psychopharmaceutical, um, maybe a class of those drugs or a specific drug, um, what it does, how it's used, uh, who's it administered to, all that kind of stuff could be the topic of a technical report. Um, in physics, again, physics wouldn't be the topic of your technical report. Uh, it would be something within physics. Um, for example, it could be a technical report on, say, black holes. It could be a technical report on, I don't know, wormholes. It could be a technical report on nuclear fusion uh, of combining atoms to produce energy. Um, and similarly with, like, say, uh, biology. Uh, you, you won't write a technical report on biology as a whole, but it could be a topic within biology, say evolution or um, uh, immunology uh, or about virology uh, or about a specific pathogen like say COVID-19. Um, a technical report on like what the virus is and what it does or maybe uh, a report on treatment options um, for COVID-19. I mean, all these are all just options that I'm like just talking about to give you all some different examples to help with your thinking. Um, similarly, for like computer info uh, systems folks in the class, it can be a project about like say a specific computer programming language, or about a topic within um, computer science such as. Uh, different types of algorithm classes or a type of software like, you know, say malware or viruses. Uh, it could be about a, uh, a specific field within computer science, like say cybersecurity um, on the software level. Uh, so again, ideas, electrical engineering uh, technology. So it could be about a specific, specific type of 
a control system or maybe the application of a control system for anything from escalators to elevators um, to different types of control systems for uh, environmental systems. Uh, I mean, again, you want to drill down into a specific topic within your field uh, that's going to be interesting for you to learn about and that by learning more about that thing, you're going to be adding to your knowledge and producing a writing sample that you'll be able to use professionally outside of our class. So some more points, and this is all coming from the syllabus, so you can also refer to the syllabus for these things. Um, so you will consolidate and present information about your selected topic in a manner consistent with a technical report, and we're going to be going over that in future lectures. Uh, clearly identify its purpose. Uh, for example, e.g., right, uh, reviewing a design or investigating a topic. Demonstrate its stated, stated purpose in a clear and straightforward manner. Uh, that is, i.e., remember, maintain a unity of thought, meaning like you're going to stick to what that topic is throughout your technical report. You're not going to start talking about one topic, like let's say, COVID-19 if you're like a bi yes, biology specialization student and then start talking about like say Ebola for example you know these are different things um, that breaks your unity of thought so you need to make sure your technical report stays focused on what it is you selected for your report um, quote and cite all sources used in your report um, and for your writing in our class, I want you to focus on quotations. You will quote things, putting them into um, quote marks, and you will provide in-text citations as well as reference entries. And we're going to be using APA format for all of that, and I'll be going over that you know, in future lectures. And as a part of that, you're going to incorporate at least, this is the minimum level, 10 cited sources, meaning that you're going to take quotes from 10 different sources that you find that are accessed through the City Tech Library. That can include the journal databases, uh, periodicals, um, including magazines and newspapers, uh, and books. And now I don't want you to think you have to go up to the library at City Tech. You can access all this online. Um, and I'm going to show you how to do that. We're going to build up to some of that over the next couple of weeks. We're going to just get started with that this week, give you some practice. And uh, finally, and I'll talk in a, in a future, uh, probably next week we'll talk about how to set all this up, uh, but you can go ahead and start this on your own, is I want you to write your technical report using Google Docs. Um, the reason for that is for submitting your project later uh, this semester and also for peer review, we're going to be using Google Docs features for uh, sharing documents and linking to documents so that they're essentially published online as like a website. Uh, I want you to learn how to do that because that can come in real handy for you later on in the workplace. So again, I want you to be writing this in Google Docs, um, and we'll talk you know, next week about getting that set up. But for right now, what I want you to do, if you don't already have a Gmail or a Google account, uh, I do want you to go to gmail.com and sign up for an account, and we'll use that for our class. So if you already have a Gmail account uh, that you can use with Google Docs, and you don't want to use that for our class, just go create a new account that you can use just for our class. Uh, for example, like I have a personal Gmail account, but I also made one um, that I just put at City Tech after my username uh, to signify that's my school account that I use for all my classwork that's separate from my personal account. But you don't have to do that. You can just use the one account you already have. You can create a new account. Either way, I don't care. Uh, but you do have to have an account so we can use it for this project. And we'll be using other Google stuff uh, in uh, the presentation project as well. All 
All right, so to begin your research on the project, and I, I don't want you to think I'm just going to dump you out in the deep end without a life preserver and expect you to be able to swim, okay? We're going to go into this project in steps, incrementally, to help you build this up over time, do good research, find good sources uh, that you're going to learn from. But to begin your research, what I want you to do first, all caps, I'm shouting at you right now, keep notes. You gotta have your notebook handy while you're doing research on the project. That way you're keeping notes of sources, you're keeping notes on important key words that you find that might help in your research, um, names of people that are in the field that you might wanna look up, all of this is where your notebook comes in handy so you can keep track of all of that. Because there's no way, unless you have eidetic memory, eidetic memory means that you, like you have photographic memory. You, Very few people in the world actually have that capability. I certainly don't. Uh, maybe you do, but if you don't honestly have that, you got to use a notebook to try to keep all this track, keep track of all this. Otherwise, you're just going to be spinning your wheels and wasting your time. Now, initially, I want you to gain familiarity with possible topics. Like, I don't want you to just like think of just one topic. We're gonna start off by having you think of a, a few different topics, at least three topics. And I want you to use a resource like Wikipedia to find out a little bit about what those topics involve, and we'll take a look at how Wikipedia can help us in our research. Also, you can use Google, and you can use modifiers like quotes, minus, the site attribute, or file type attribute to help you in your research. So why don't we take a look at that first. Um, we'll start with Wikipedia. So if I go to wikipedia.org, um, why don't I type in something like, um, how about you see programming language? thinking of computer science as a topic. Like you could do a report on the C programming language. And so by looking and reading over this Wikipedia article, I can learn a lot about C in terms of how it was developed, who was involved in developing it, how it works, like its syntax, different types of data types, um, you can see there are sections on memory management, libraries, language use, uses for the C programming language. Uh, but these things down here at the bottom, after I've read all that, is where we can really help ourselves with our further research. So I can go to 11, C also. This will, the C also section of a Wikipedia page is useful for finding things that are related to that topic that might help expand my understanding. So like by going and looking at uh, C programming language on Wikipedia, after reading this page, I might think, you know, do I really want to write my research project on C? Or maybe I want to specialize on like a C compiler or maybe a class of C libraries, like maybe libraries that help with graphics or libraries that help with audio and sound. Uh, so there's a lot of different options the more I drill down into it and learn more that I can think about that might be more interesting and beneficial to me than just trying to write about something so huge as the C programming language. But also the reference section. The references of a Wikipedia article is where all the knowledge that gets presented in the article comes from. Just like when you're writing your research report, you're going to have your own references section that point back to at least 10 library-based sources. Well, these resources here, some of them are available online. Some of them you might be able to find through our library's website. And simply copying, pasting, or following a link like this History of C is a way to like learn more by following these hyperlinks or using these words, these or uh, terms or titles uh, on the library's website uh, to further your research, like you're letting their research help you.
that's perfectly allowable on the project again as long as 10 resources that you're quoting and citing in your your um, research report come from the library after those 10 you can use other resources there's one caveat about that though any resources that you use in your project that don't come through the library you are going to have to vet meaning you're going to have to evaluate them and establish why they are useful authoritative accurate sources of knowledge one source you can't use or quote from in your research report is Wikipedia the re there's a couple of reasons one reason is that Wikipedia is an encyclopedia it aggregates information from other places it is not the source of new knowledge the source of its knowledge is contained in all these references down at the bottom of each article so you can use the references if you can find them through the library's website or if they're beyond uh, the li you, your required 10 sources if they're like a web source like this one here history of C then you might be able to use one of those sources but Wikipedia itself is off limits for a citable source I want you to learn from it because you can definitely learn from it but it's not the place you go uh, to be quoting uh, for a research report like this um, another thing about uh, Wikipedia though that again is is beneficial to you is that the folks that write this and contribute to this have done a lot of work that can help you think about your topic done the work of thinking about how you know, what are the main subtopics in the topic you've selected that might be beneficial or important for you to discuss in your research report so you can learn from it but again it's not the kind of source you're going to be citing from and again another reason not to cite from Wikipedia is the fact that it changes all the time um, you know, unless a page is locked down for like security reasons um, if you click on any articles view history in the upper right hand corner you're able to see the the revisions that have taken place over time um, I mean just you know, since July we got a whole page of changes that have taken place on this article so if you were to quote from it the things you quote will likely have changed at some point in the future or by the time you turn in your uh, research report as it with it being a dynamic and constantly changing document it makes it difficult to accurately cite that kind of information so again Wikipedia you use for learning and for following up some of those resources but not as a resource that you quote from in your uh, research report but now the other thing that uh, I did uh, recommend that that you use is to go to Google now with Google there's those operators I mentioned or modifiers quotes minus sign site file type so like let's say I wanted to search for I don't know why don't we start with like black holes um, if I can spell it right black holes now this is going to you know, give me uh, different results that have been personalized to me because you can see that I'm logged in and Google tracks you know my search history uh, my geographic location and uses that whenever it's presenting different results your results when you search just for black holes might be different than those that I find whenever I do a search so we can see we got two sites that bring up NASA which that's pretty cool um, it also brings up as the third search result black hole on Wikipedia that's also alright for helping us learn about it we scroll down I mean, it's giving us a lot of different types of sources it's showing us some physicists um, nationalgeographic.com space.com britannica.com and other encyclopedia not a source we want to be citing from for research uh, report 
But now, what if I were to put that into quotes? I wonder what's going to happen. And I'll say, first off, like it doesn't actually show me how many search results there are now. Search results didn't change. So how about I use one of my modifiers uh, besides quotes? So first off, by using quotes, what I'm telling Google to do is look for that term between the quotation marks. So instead of looking individually for the word black and holes in the same page, it's looking for the phrase black holes. Um, because Google is good at guessing what our intent is, because the way it's designed, it's going to give me good results for a term like black holes. But if I were to do a search for something else, it might not be as clear cut in giving me the type of results I want. But now let's say uh, I wanted to search for something that's black holes, but it's excluding something uh, that I see here. So for whatever reason, uh, I see here on the second search result, science.nasa.gov, science mission directory. What if I don't want to receive any results that have the word directorate? Directorate, right? So you see that word there, directorate in the title of that page, and now I've written it here, but I put a minus sign in front of it. That search uh, result is now gone. So the minus excludes things. And what you'll find as you learn more about the topic you select if you want to narrow down your topic because maybe the search results you're getting are just too much, there may be terms that you can exclude by putting minus and whatever that term is to help narrow down your results into the things you actually want to be looking at. But now for black holes, like let's say I, I want to look on pages, not at NASA, I mean NASA is great, but let's say I want to look at maybe what people at schools and colleges say about black holes. Well, this is where I can use uh, the modifier site. So what site colon does is narrow down your results to a specific website or to a top level domain name uh, like um, .com, .gov, .edu, .org. So why don't I change site to edu? So what it'll do is now only show me results that come from schools, .edu sites. And so it started off by showing me Harvard because Google is going to rank that pretty highly in its results because a lot of people are linking to the Harvard site. Also see Caltech, another prestigious school is up here in the top rankings. Um, we see MIT, um, Northwestern. So a lot of prestigious schools that have pages about black holes are showing up right at the top of the search results. But now let's say I really wanted those NASA sites. Well, I could say site colon GOV and it'll bring up any government site. So NASA, NASA, Here's the National Science Foundation, National Science Foundation, uh, National Institute of, let's see, Health. Yeah, it's strange that they have an entry on black holes here. Oh, because it's in a journal that's hosted uh, in the National Library of Medicine. That's the reason why. Um, so sometimes you can get kind of surprising results that way. Here's energy.gov, the energy department's website has something about black holes. But now, if I want to, I can specifically say a uh, specific website. So I could just say nasa.gov as my site. And now all of the results that I get are going to be on NASA. Uh, that are, you know, the, the domain name will be nasa.gov. But now the final um, modifier I want to show you is file type. This is sometimes cool if you want to see if maybe uh, a PDF on a given website might have the words you're looking for. So I've typed file type colon PDF 
enter. Now it's bringing up not web pages, but PDF results. Interesting facts about black holes. And this looks like some sort of brochure that they must print and give out. And judging by the pictures and the small amount of text, it's probably something oriented for children uh, to read. Starmaps.pdf. Uh, black hole facts. Tells about them. Where are the black holes? Like in May, the May-June sky, the July-August sky, September-October sky. This is pretty cool stuff that they show you here. But it, I'm sure this was in the search results originally, but it could have been so far down, we might never have found it, and, and except for the fact that we use the file type modifier in our search to look for PDFs. You could also try um, like JPG if you just want to see if there might be an image uh, relating to that on the site. Um, and I'm not pulling up anything when I do that. So I'm going to remove directory. Yeah, still not seeing anything. Uh, we could type in uh, file type DOCX. And so now it's bringing up Word doc files that are on NASA websites. Press release, Word template, Astrophysics Science Division document. Uh, so I mean, you can find a, like a transcript of some uh, resource, maybe a video. So you can find a lot of interesting files this way that might you know, enlighten you more that you can actually cite uh, using APA uh, if that is useful to your project. But it's, I mean, again, not required. I'm just trying to show you ways to improve your initial research where you're just trying to you know, pick a topic, see what's out there, and learn a little bit to help aid you in your research. Now I say here, based on your initial research, you will learn specific terms, acronyms, abbreviations that you can use as keywords uh, in your research, both on Google and on Wikipedia, as well as in the library's databases, which you're going to be required to use uh, when you're writing your project. So for this week, I want you just to get started with using one database in the library. And I'm sure you've probably used it before in your English 1101 or 1121 class, um, but we're going to use this just to help you see what's out there and to familiarize yourself with a tool that's built into all of the databases. It works in different ways depending on which database you use, but it helps you with your references at the end of your document. So let's begin by taking a look at Academic Search Complete on the library's website. So the way you find it is you want to go to library.citytech.cuny.edu. That's the library's website. And then scroll down, and over on the left-hand side, what we want to do is find articles. We're going to be looking for database articles. These are scholarly articles that are collected together in databases, which cost a lot of money. Uh, but because you're a student at City Tech, you have access to them. And you can use the databases to look up anything at all. I mean, you can learn things on your own using the databases that once you graduate from City Tech, you won't have access to anymore. So you want to take advantage of this while you can, while you're a student at City Tech. So we're looking for Academic Search Complete. So under Browse by Name, let's click on A. And you see Academic One File by Gale. That's good. We're going to look at that later, uh, next lecture probably. But this week, I just want to focus on Academic Search Complete EBSCO. So click on that. And you're going to have off-campus access. Click there. It's going to ask you to log in with your CUNY First username and password. Log in. And then we're on Academic Search Complete EBSCO. Now, EBSCO doesn't work like Google. It doesn't try to guess at what you're looking for. You, it presents search results um, ex, you know, specifically on what you search for. So, uh, for example, 
what we can do is let's, let's go back to my earlier example and let's look at let's search for like C programming language. I'm gonna click search. Now, when I search for that, you can see I brought up a whole lot of search results, 1,301 search results. I mean, I, and I'm not expecting you to go through all of these as a part of your research right now. But there are some ways we can narrow it down to make it uh, a little bit easier to find what we're looking for. So let's limit it to full text. So I put a check next to full text on the left. You see the search results drop by like a thousand. Now it's only 335 results. And what that does is when I limit to full text, it only shows me things that I can access because the databases actually have a lot more in them than what specifically City Tech can afford to get access to. Um, there are other ways to get things that aren't specifically listed in the databases that we have access to, uh, but that you don't have to worry about that for our specific project. Uh, but that involves using interlibrary loan, if, if you heard that phrase before. Now, what I want you to focus on for your initial research right now, so you've looked at Wikipedia, you've looked on Google, you've got some ideas about maybe three different terms, different topics for your research project. I want you to plug in what that topic is into Academic Search Complete and see how many search results are coming up because that can tell you a lot about whether it'll be you know, easier or harder for you to do your research on the project. I don't want you to choose a topic that you can't find anything in the databases for. Now, certainly as you begin working on your project, if you ever get in a bind, I want you to reach out to me and I'll help you with your research and try to give you a push. I don't mind doing that. But right now, you're doing your due diligence to try to pick the best topic possible. So if you start with like three topics and then you try them in EBSCOhost to see how many uh, topics come up, you can weigh that against what you learned by reading about it on, say, Wikipedia and with some Google searches to decide which of those three potential topics you are going to choose as the topic for your research report. Okay, now you're going to be using Academic Search Complete once you've finalized your topic um, on the research report. So you start with like three topics, you do a little bit of this basic research just to see what's out there to read up a little bit about what's out there. Once you've decided, I want you then to be able to find 10 sources. You're not gonna download them and read them. I want you to simply find 10 sources and copy and paste their reference information in APA format for this week's weekly writing assignment. So let me show you how you find that APA formatted reference for 10 sources. And it doesn't matter which of these 10 sources, I think it would be more beneficial if you went through these and tried to pick sources that you might want to read later for your report. But for right now, it's okay if some of these, you, know, you just pick the first 10. But if you got time, go deeper into the search results to see what's out there. So. If we start with this first uh, article that we can see uh, is available as a PDF full text. Well, let me show you one other thing that I, I forgot we can do with, it, with Academic Search Complete that I do want you to do. So don't only check full text. I want you to check full text, but I also want you to check under source types over here on the left, academic journals. There we go. That actually is going to get rid of that first uh, search result that we had because that was coming from uh, you know, a, a magazine <laughs> or newspaper. The reason why we do that, that we check full text, full text determines what we have access to, 
but we also check academic journals so that we're only getting sources that have been peer reviewed, that, have, that appear in an uh, academic journal that uses the peer review process to make sure that the knowledge in those articles are accurate and that they're being published because they're adding something new to what we call discourse. Discourse are the larger conversations that we have around different topics. Like there's a discourse around black holes, there's a discourse around the C programming language, there's a discourse about electromechanical design of elevators. All of these have a discourse. And discourse takes place in different places. Part of it's on Twitter, some of it is in newspapers, some of it is in magazines, and some of it is in academic journals. We want to be looking at academic journals because you're producing a research report, meaning you're looking at other people's research. Where does research get published? Academic journals. Usually magazines and newspapers, they simply copy and summarize the search result or research results of other people that publish their stuff in academic journals. We want to go to the source. We don't want to go to uh, a second-hand account of the research that you're interested in. Okay, so I have our search result list here. See programming language, I've checked full text, I've checked academic journals, right? So what I want you to be looking for for this week's weekly writing assignment is you click on one of these articles and you basically click on the title that's next to the number, okay? So performance optimization, modeling, fine grain, irregular communication in UPC. Click that. Now, on this page, we have all the bibliographic information we need. The title, the authors, the source, this journal called Scientific Programming, uh, subject terms. We have an abstract, which you can, you can read this. And that abstract is just a summary of the article. So you can read that summary and get an idea what the whole article is about without having to read the whole article. Okay. You can also see on the left that you can read the whole article by clicking on HTML full text, meaning that's just a web page for the article, or you can download a PDF so it'll look just like the article in the published version that they mail out to people and to libraries. Uh, I, both of these will ha have the same text, but PDF full text will give you like page numbers uh, and, be, and probably be easier to cite from. But all I really want you to focus on besides like, you know, checking out these pages, scroll down, read the abstract, but then look over here on the right. On each of these pages for an article, you're going to see a, a link for site. If you click site, uh, Academic Search Complete EBSCO will automatically create uh, a citation for your reference section in APA format. See, it's producing results uh, in all these different standards, Brazilian National Standards, American Medical Association. If I scroll down, you can see MLA, which you probably used in 1101, maybe 1121. But let's go back up to APA, American Psychological Association. That's what we're using for our class for all of our citations. So here, you can just drag your mouse over and copy that, copy, and then go into the document that you're creating for uh, this week's weekly writing assignment. So like, let's say I'm on Google Drive, I'm going to create a new Google Doc to from subject date 10-20-2021 will be next Wednesday to Professor Ellis from is going to be your name and subject is going to be research expedition memo Alright, so before I actually copy and paste that in there, let me show you this week's weekly writing assignment, which is going to be involving 
you talking about your potential topics and then using that site tool built into Academic Search Complete. So for this week's weekly writing assignment, we're going to help you start your research on the research project, the research report project. I want you to write a memo with the subject research expedition memo that has two parts. The first part of your memo, I want you to discuss three possible topics for your research report and conclude with the topic you have selected and give a strong reason why you selected it. For example, you can write, I choose this, comma, because, and then tell me why. It could be because you found more information about that topic than the other two. It could be that you got more interested in it after reading the Wikipedia pages for the other, for all three topics you were thinking about. I mean, whatever the reason is, it doesn't matter. You just tell me why. Uh, but the thing is you want to discuss what those three possible topics are before you tell me what the one is that you selected. So you can tell me about like what you learned about them, maybe it cleared up some um, something you didn't know about them, uh, any of that kind of stuff can go into that discussion. Um, and that first part, you want to aim for roughly 250 words. I mean, it needs to be a good discussion, a deliberation about the three topics you might choose from and which one that you ultimately did choose. Now the second part, I want you to begin that with a sentence something like this. The following sources form the beginnings of my research on X. And then just type in you know, what your topic is where I have X. Below that line, provide an alphabetized list of at least 10 bibliographic entries in APA format related to the topic found through Academic Search Complete EBSCO. So you're going to find 10 articles using Academic Search Complete uh, and you're going to use the built-in site tool to copy and paste an APA formatted citation uh, for each of those articles. So let's go back over to um, the Google Doc. So to, from, subject date, subject research expedition memo, part one text, 250 words, discussing your possible three terms, and conclude with your final choice and why you chose it. The part two text you want to say the following sources form the beginning of my research on, we'll say, the C programming language. Now you see where I write part one text and part two text, I shouldn't, shouldn't have to, you know, always remind you, but th this is just helper text for you. Don't include that in your memo. The memos need to be from your voice and your words and don't need this you know, extra explanatory text. Uh, this is just simply to help you see that this is one part of the memo and part two text is the second part of your memo. So after that, we're going to skip down maybe one line and Remember, uh, I was on Academic Search Complete. I copied site, went down to APA 7th edition, and I copied that text. Go back over to Google Docs, and I'm going to paste that. Well, I'm going to press Control V to paste that text into Google Docs. Now, let's go back over to Academic Search Complete. We have this first entry here, beginning with the last name Lagravier, La right? So, Academic Search Complete. I'm gonna go back to my result list. And now I'm gonna click on two, my second search result. You see I can download the article if I want to read it. I can see who it's by, Wendy Logan. I see it was an EE Evaluation Engineering. 
but what we're looking for specifically is site. So I'm going to click site. Then I scroll down to APA and I copy that APA entry. Copy. Go back over to Google Docs and then I'm going to press Control V to paste it. Now in this case it actually works out. Like Gravier, LA, and then Logan, LO. We want to have this alphabetized. So if I go back to EBSCO, go back to result list, let's see about the third entry. Uh, this one is by uh, this, uh, the first author's name is, last name is Altentis. So let's click on that, Peer Assisted Learning Experience in Computer Programming Language Learning. You see I can read it, HTML full text, PDF full text, I can see the authors, I can see what journal it was published in, Innovations in Education and Teaching International. I see there's an abstract I can read, so I can just read that abstract and I'll know what that article is about, and then get all the details by reading the full article. But then I want to turn my attention to Cite. I'm going to click that. There we go. I'm going to scroll down, look for APA again, APA, and then I just select that entry here, like that. Right click, copy, go back over to Google Docs, but now let's remember, the first author's last name is A, right? So if I'm alphabetizing my reference list, I want the first one to be Altentis. So we got A, LA, and then LO, right? So your 10 entries here, that's three, add seven more, that's going to be your 10 beginning research sources. Now, as I mentioned before, these 10 sources that you put here on this memo do not have to be the sources you use in your uh, uh, research essay. You might find that you know, the, this initial research, maybe only one of them will be useful to you, and you'll have to do more research to find uh, other useful sources. Um, so I don't want you to think you have to use them and they have to be perfect. Right now, I want you to focus on learning how to do searches with Academic Search Complete, right? Typing in terms, seeing how many search results there are, and then limiting the search results by checking full text and then checking academic journals. There are other tools to help you narrow your search results, but I think this will, this will get you started so that you can learn how to do basic searches and then how to use the site tool to get an APA formatted citation for your memo. So after you've written this uh, memo, remember part one, you discuss three possible terms and then you tell me which one you choose and why. Part two, you write the following sources from the, from the beginning of my research on whatever the topic is. And then give me 10 citations that are generated by Academic Search Complete from those search results that you found, okay? Use the cite tool. I just want to give you some practice with it and give you some sources that you can follow up on later. Again, as I mentioned before, Keep notes. That's absolutely important for your success on this project. If you don't keep notes, you're going to be wasting time having to redo things uh, as you're going through your research. So always have your notebook out while you're doing research, both using sources to, to learn from, like Wikipedia and Google, but also when you're doing searches on the library's databases with Academic Search Complete by EBSCO. All right? So this, mem this memo for the weekly writing assignment will help get you started on the project by finding out how to use the research tools and how to, you know, using those research tools to make an informed decision about the topic you choose. Remember that topic has to be of a scientific or technical nature that's related to your major or what your specialization is, okay? 
Uh, you can't choose something that is totally unrelated to what you're learning in your degree program and what you're going to be doing when you graduate. Um, make sure I'm clear on that, uh, that it needs to be relevant because again I want the document to be relevant to you once you leave my class. So don't pick something that you think will just simply be easy. Pick something that you'll learn from. Use this as an opportunity to learn because that's the kind of thing that will distinguish you when you're out in the job market looking for that, that first big career job. Because um, you have to imagine there are so many people that are graduating with the exact same degree that you're getting, that are getting the same education you got. So you have to distinguish yourself really of your own initiative and this is a way you can do that. I'm, I'm giving you an opportunity, I want you to seize it because I know how important it can be because these things I'm giving you advice on are things I've done myself and they help me tremendously. Uh, so please, please listen to the things I'm saying about this. So this weekly writing memo is going to help get you started on the project um, so we'll know what you're going to be picking for your topic and it'll give you some practice using the site tool on Academic Search Complete. After you've completed this in Google Docs, right, just you know, write it up somewhere, um, give it a good name, you know, this can be like your weekly writing assignment week six, right, cool. Then just copy everything from your memo, copy, and then again, just to remind everybody, uh, for the weekly writing assignments, go back to our Open Lab page. I'm going to have a new weekly writing assignment for week six. Click on the link for that. Scroll down. You'll see the comment box. Paste your work. Look it over. Make sure it looks right. If there, if you need to add like spaces, just click and and, and press enter. Move things around as you need to. Once you're happy with it. Um, click post comment okay and then it'll take a minute and then you'll see your work show up there and I'll show you just a I'll just say test comment see it takes a minute but when once it's posted you'll see your name and the comment there and you won't be able to edit it anymore except by clicking edit over there so watch for that that'll be week six weekly writing assignment all right, what else we got? That's everything. So right now, you make sure you remember to get your job application portfolio turned in. I'll be giving you a link to this Dropbox page. Rename your documents correctly, as I've indicated here in the instructions. Uh, and then, uh, and of course, complete peer review before you do that. And again, if you need extra time on it, that's fine. Just drop me an email, let me know what's going on. And again, my email address is here, jls at citytech.cuny.edu. And then you can also come to my office hours on Wednesday between 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. Google Hangouts. The link is on our open lab site. All right. So, again, good luck with everything. Uh, stay healthy. Remember to mask up. Maintain social distance when you're around other people. Uh, eat good. Uh, get plenty of rest. you got to do everything you can to keep yourself healthy, especially if you're really stressed out and got a lot of stuff going on. You gotta do everything you can to sustain yourself to see this semester through. And if there's anything I can help you as far as the class is concerned, make sure you reach out to me. So take care everyone, and I'll be talking to you all again real soon.